Here we are at part three. Okay, now that we have the general instrument set up, what we need to do is go in, make sure everything's looping properly, and then talk about some reverb. So the last thing we need to do is get everything looped so you can hold the key down for as long as you want. And instead of going kind of a step at a time into super detail and giving you like a contact tutorial, I'm just going to explain how I do it. In the mapping editor, you can view by list right here, which takes all of these samples. Now we can see them individually. And if you double click on any of them, it's going to pull up the waveform. Now, I've already looped these. So as I click through, you can see everything, nothing's locked to the grid. Everything's looped a little differently. The yellow region is where the loop is. And that's part of the key to getting the randomness over time. And this last one has not been looped yet. So I'll do it as an example. You turn on the loop. And it can be a little tricky to know if you're changing your loop point, which is the yellow, or if you're changing your start time. So a lot of times I move them both in and I always roll the start time back to here. Now the loop point is going to be something not like this because you don't want it to get to the end of the file and jump back in to kind of an unnatural peak. Usually I pick something that's got a little bit of a dip in it. And then um, for the ending, it really is a matter of giving it enough tail so that when you create your crossfade, let's say that's a, basically 1.1 seconds, you've got 1.1 seconds of handle over here so that it can crossfade correctly over here. And that's literally all I do for looping. So I'm going to pull up just the quiet, pull the CC fader for number 11 down to zero. So we're only going to hear the quiet samples and I'm going to play the original sample and you can see it progressing there at the bottom of the screen. Now let's listen and see if we can hear something looping. No. Now one of the reasons is there's four different loops going on at once, so that by nature is sort of covering itself up. Where you saw this one wave file loop is not where the other three wave files looped. And when you combine that with the fact that they've got crossfades on them, it's pretty much just impossible to tell. Um, I can turn up the loud one. Now this one might be a little more obvious because I can already hear a pattern. There's that little bend at the beginning. It's not this sample, but right around here. If I wanted to be really picky, I could go in and just for that one sample, edit the loop point so it didn't include that loop. So I've noticed a lot of times, and it happens with live players as well, you give them 15 or 20 seconds to do something. The first five to eight seconds are usually them kind of figuring it out, not in a bad way, just in a, what am I going to do? And then they sort of settle in to a natural way that they just repeat that little phrase. And I did the exact same thing subconsciously when I was playing all the gestures on the cello. So a lot of times you want to avoid looping that beginning part uh, until they kind of fall into the regular pattern. Because you want it to be regular enough you can loop it without telling that there's a loop, if that makes sense. Now the last thing we want to do, since we've got everything looping, is honestly part of my favorite thing to do, and that's creating random start times. I'm going to close out the wave editor. I'm going to close out the mapping editor. We're just going to look at the group editor. I want to edit all groups. That means whatever I'm doing next is going to be added to both the quiet and the loud group. And this is where we add the randomness. So where we added an external source before, down here, under the filter, we're going to go to the source itself instead of editing something to the filter. We're tying it directly to the source and we're going to add random unipolar. Now what this does, if I click on Forte, you see it's random unipolar. If I click on here, random unipolar. And we're going to change that to sample start. And you see when I switch between the groups, it's the same thing. So the editing is working. I don't know how many times I can tell you I've thought I was editing both groups and I end up not. 
Now this is the percentage of randomness. So if I turn the randomness all the way down and just listen to the loud forte layer, it's the same thing, right? Now if we turn this up to say 50%, I think normally I have it turned up pretty much 100%. Because the idea is that the percentage of randomness, if this is your wave file and you have it on, say, 50%, then it's going to randomize the start within 50% somehow of the wave file. If you have 10%, then you know maybe it's going to be randomizing it this way, but it's always staying within that percentage. If you have it at 100%, that means it's randomizing the start time pretty much over the whole wave file, which is what I like to do, because it just means more random. More random is always good. And if we have it on the quiet... It's not working. And why is that? Because contact defaults right now. This is in sampler mode, which allows for randomness. This one is defaulting to DFD. We need that to be in sampler mode as well. Now you'll notice if I play it. It's playing at different points. But Jason, it sounds so unrealistic with a cutoff like that. I know, so why don't we fix that? Let's go down here and turn our attack up. Need to do the same thing for the second group. So since the second group did not have an envelope, what we're gonna do is add an envelope to it. Now we can change our attack to like 300 something, pull the release down to 300 something, 136 and 300. Why don't we do the same thing for that? Oh, for the, you know, for the hard one, I think we wanna have a much faster attack. Just enough so that it's not clipping at the beginning like this. There we go. Now the nice thing about this is you can do things like this. And everyone's going to be different because you not only have something randomizing the attack time, it's doing that for all four samples. So you're getting four random start points within each one of those four layers that we recorded. And on top of that, you have four different lengths of looping. So literally, it's the kind of thing where even if it was a 20 second, 30 second loop, if you faded it in and faded it out each time, it's going to be different because you've got random start times and random loop points. Okay, so I'm going to save this and then open it up in Cubase. All right, I popped our newly made cello instrument into Cubase and literally threw ProR on it at the default setting, which is this. I think I might have the mix set like that, but this is just how it comes up. Um, let's pull it back a little bit and do a little more space. And you can see the keyboard, so you can see what I'm gonna play. Let's see, our original pitch is up at this G now. So that's what I played originally. And I'm just moving the expression wheel up like the tiniest bit. Let's get into the next layer.
So this difference that you're hearing here, from that to that, that's the filter on the quiet layer along with the tiny bit of volume modulation. So I can stop and it's completely static. Or I can make it quiet and it's completely static. What's nice is when you build this with automation curves and make it, it's, you can make it as smooth or as quick as you want. I'm just playing in real time. So let's get into the top layer again. That's the, like, the open version of the quiet layer. Here comes the forte layer. I'm at about 75%. And that's all the way up. So that's with the one note, the original note. Um, a lot of times I've found samples do much better pitching down than pitching up, but just for the heck of it, we can go up like an octave and see how that sounds. That's not bad. Now, one thing that is a bummer when you're using this sort of mode where it's pitching up on one giant sample if you do tremolo, like I was doing, it starts sounding a little silly because it gets really kind of chipmunky, and you can just tell that it's sped up. That's why a lot of times um, when I did the sampling of the tremolo strings, I would get maybe minor thirds at the most so that I had kind of the normal speed of tremolo. And if you go from here... up a minor third... Still sounds a little sped up, but it's not as bad as this. And honestly, in a mix with a bunch of other stuff, that was probably fine as well. But what I really want to do is go down low. And that's actually with not a lot of reverb. If we give it what I would probably consider a more appropriate mix to verb to dry for sound design, something higher like that, you can get some really interesting sounds. Right? I mean, that. thank you, Amazon, for the incredibly cheap cello. And I, I know I, I used a good microphone, and I'm, I'm going into an API mic pre, but it's not about the gear. It's about what you're capturing and the emotion that you're going for. Obviously, for this, the emotion I was going for was terrifying, but it's very easy for me to do stuff like this technique-wise because it doesn't require any technique. I can do clusters and scratchy stuff all day long, but it's just incredible to me, even today, how something as simple as a single cello playing something four times 
ends up being this huge sounding thing. So of course you can grab this contact instrument with the samples, the original 24 bit WAV files right off of uh, Patreon. It costs a buck if you wanna be a member and grab it and then like cancel at the end of the month, that's totally fine. Um, I would love to hear if you end up using it in anything or even taking these samples and doing something more extreme with them, even better. I would love to hear any ideas that you have come up with and implemented based on this kind of easy sampling. And by easy, I mean, you don't need a Telefunk and mic. You can use your iPhone, throw it into GarageBand. It's really limited by your creativity and imagination. <laughs>